Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ed Sheregin, the founding director of the Baker Institute, and it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to Rice University's Baker Institute this evening. I'd like to begin by uh, thanking our co-sponsors for uh, their support of this event, the Center for the Study of the Environment and Society, and the Shell Center for Sustainability, uh, both here at uh, Rice University and also the Hart Center Institute for the Gulf of Mexico Studies at Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi. Uh, many individuals have uh, dedicated their time and talent to organize both uh, this evening's presentation and tomorrow's uh, academic event. If you've seen the program, it's quite, quite an interesting uh, schedule of uh, presentations tomorrow. Uh, these are especially doctors Neil Lane and uh, Kirsten Matthews, who lead the Baker Institute Science and Technology Policy Program. Uh, the mission of this program is to provide a, a space for policymakers and scientists to engage in substantive dialogue with the hope that public policy will more accurately reflect and be more consistent with uh, scientific uh, knowledge. I would also uh, like to acknowledge and thank uh, Dr. Andre Droxler, professor in the Department of Earth Science and director of the Center for the Study of Environment and Society at Rice University. In fact, I've got a little competition with this delightful little girl here tonight. <laughs> I think I'll ask her to come up and make the introductions. <laughs> but uh, in fact, I'm delighted to announce to you today that I have appointed Professor Droxler as a Baker Institute Scholar, so we're very uh, honored and proud to have you with us. Uh, in this position, he will continue to be a major contributor to uh, our policy research programs, and Andre's been working with us for many, many years, uh, really since the very beginning. We're also uh, very grateful for the support of Dr. John <coughs> W. Uh, Tonell Jr., Associate Director of the Hart Research uh, Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies and a Regents Professor at Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi. Uh, before continuing, I have to admit to you, I'm a so-called Middle East expert that I previously did not know that fully formed coral reefs can be found uh, off the coast of Texas. Uh, as you may know, Texas actually has four of them. They are part of the uh, Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, which is located about 105 miles south of Port Arthur. Tex Texas's significant marine environment certainly deserves uh, wider appreciation and recognition. Coral reefs are an important but fragile part of our planet's ecosystem. Uh, following the 2010 Deepwater Horizon tragedy, a small coral reef near the epicenter of the uh, oil spill was severely damaged. But Texas's reefs appear to be unscathed thus far. Uh, Long-term threats to coral reefs include not only storms, coral diseases and pollution, but also overfishing, effects from climate change, and rising levels of ocean acidity. In fact, Dr. Jane Lubchenka, the administration of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency has called this oceanic acidification, the evil twin of climate change. So whether or not you agree with her choice of words, conserving our planet's priceless natural resources is, is indeed a major challenge uh, for current and future generations. Now our speaker this evening is a noted photographer, author, and photojournalist, and he is widely considered one of the best underwater photographers in the United States. A resident of Houston, he has an extensive portfolio of photography of the Texas coral reefs. His most recent book is Texas Coral Reefs, which was published by the uh, Texas A&M Press. Let me add that I'm very impressed by his photos of marine life in the Gulf of Mexico and by incredibly, uh, how incredibly close he gets to the subjects of his ph photography, especially those uh, scalloped hammerhead and other sharks. <laughs> In fact, I think a w there's a word for that. It's called bait. Uh, but you have survived uh, this proximity, and uh, we commend you for that. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the talented and courageous Jesse Canselmo to the program. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, thanks very much, and I will say it's, it's really an honor and, and a pleasure to be here tonight and share with everybody my passion for the Flower Garden Banks and Texas Coral Reefs. But before I start, let me just mention one thing about the title and what I'm about to show. Uh, 50 reasons to love anything is an awful lot of reasons. And, um, but actually, when it comes to the flower garden banks and Texas coral reefs, I have about 6,000 reasons to love. And that's how many images that I've captured off the coast of Texas in the past 20 to 25 years. Now, we don't have enough time tonight to go through 6,000 images, of course. So what I've done is I've taken about 50 of what I feel best represent what we have out there and, uh, and share that with everybody and, and talk through these 50 slides. Actually, there's a few more than 50 I added in. And I'm gonna show you the flower garden banks and I'm also gonna show you a few other of Texas reefs uh, that are out there alongside of the flower garden banks. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. And this gives you a little orientation because what I'm talking about tonight and showing you tonight is within 150 to 160 miles of where we're all sitting here tonight in this room. And uh, I'm gonna have, well you can see right here, the East Flower Gardens and the West Flower Gardens. The add-on to the Marine Sanctuary is Stetson Bank. They, these are all protected reefs. And that's gonna be most of the images that I show tonight, but I'm also gonna give you a little glimpse of Saunier Bank, Geyer Bank, and Bright Bank. And really consider this a virtual dive to these places that uh, if you haven't been there tonight, maybe after seeing these images, you'll feel like you have been there. So we're gonna start off with the East and West Flower Garden Banks. And when you make your descent there, um, these, these two banks are very, these reefs are very similar. They're about 12 miles apart. And what first strikes a diver <clears throat> when they make their descent down the line is they see these huge boulders of star coral, like this one here. They just go on and on and on. They project up six, seven, eight feet high. They're just huge, and they're all living uh, hard corals. The flower garden banks is just absolutely loaded with and just filled with hard corals for as far as you can see. This image right here, and, and let me say this, the images I'm showing tonight range in time from images I took as long as 20 years ago to last week. And the reason why I say that is this image right here was taken Thursday of last week at the East Flower Gardens. And I was just astounded at how healthy and colorful the flower gardens remain after all this time. But you can see the sponges, the star corals, uh, the symmetrical brain coral on the left, and lots and lots of fish, as you'll see here. Uh, a lot of the formations, like this one here, have, have just thousands of fish hovering overhead. And for a photographer, make a really, really striking image. And for a diver, just wow. Here's another image that was taken last week. I was out there Thursday and Friday and, and we had excellent conditions and visibility. These coral heads, these huge coral heads at the East and West Flower Gardens typically have uh, 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 different types of uh, brown chromis and other small fish just hovering overhead that make, make a really uh, sensational visual. And again, here's another a uh, huge star coral formation with brown chromis and a diver swimming by so you can get some, some scale and perspective to how enormous these coral formations are. Here's a, a brain coral, again, with, with uh, a lot of life. And you can see the sunlight shining through in the background and just spectacular day. This is another image, a recent image from just last week. And here you can see the uh, artistic wonders of nature that just amaze me. I've been going out here, as I mentioned, for more than 25 years and never tire of going out because every trip I see something new and different. 
And this image here, I just looked up and it just looked like a uh, nature's artistic masterpiece of work with the different colors that you see on the underside of the symmetrical coral that's capping over this uh, almost toadstool looking formation. And then to the left, you see uh, what is fire coral. And that spread of fire coral just looks like a, an artist did it with a paintbrush. And here's another uh, image. Uh, I had a, a diver that I was diving with last week who was very accommodating on some of these photographs. And right below her, you see this, uh, this piece of orange elephant ear sponge that looks like a kind of look, looks like a Gumby man. And some of the life that you see out there, not just fish, but a lot of invertebrate, a lot of invertebrate life, like this uh, lobster. And it's not unusual to see lobster at the Flower Garden Banks and at Stetson Bank just walking around during the day because, see, these are normally nocturnal creatures. And yet, um, this image here was taken right in the middle of the day at the East Flower Garden Banks with this lobster just prancing around, walking around the reef. And I've seen this at the East Flower Gardens, and I've also seen it at Stetson Bank. It's really uh, cool to see this. And here's one of, the, one of the very, very top reasons to love the Flower Garden Banks. Of course, this is a manta ray. And these manta rays frequent these reefs. Uh, you see them just about every trip out there. And this one here, you can see the uh, shark sucker holding on underneath, and, and some pilot fish helping them out uh, up front there. And here's another manta, manta ray image where you can see the uh, very individual markings that the manta rays have. They're like fingerprints. And these very distinct, unique markings are what marine scientists use to identify uh, these animals, these manta rays. This manta, this is a recent, this is a 2011 photograph, and um, the thing that struck me about this manta ray as it swam by, I've seen a lot of manta rays with a lot of different markings before, but this, uh, this marking was kind of unusual. It almost looked like some kind of a stain. And now we're talking sharks. Yeah. <laughs> this is a school of hammerhead sharks, and this, believe it or not, is a reason to really love the Flower Garden Banks for me, and I hope for, for all of you. Uh, these sharks are no threat whatsoever. They're not aggressive sharks when they're in the school, and it's a very interesting the time of year that you see these hammerhead school, it's always in the winter months, from the months of February to early April. Every year when you go out there, you'll see congregations of scalloped hammerhead sharks. And this is the type of thing you see when you go to the Galapagos Islands. But you don't have to go to the Galapagos Islands, you just have to go off the Texas coast 100 miles in the wintertime. And you can see the same type of just uh, sensational marine life. And then here's another one, another winter feature of the Flower Garden Banks and, and the Texas Coral Reefs are these schooling uh, spotted stingrays. And they come and pass through and swim around uh, in, in the winter months. And again, a very, very sensational sight to see indeed the largest fish in the ocean, the whale shark, and yet completely harmless, a plankton eater. Some of these are up to 60 feet long, and they frequent the flower garden banks and Texas coral reefs uh, on a um, uh, pretty uh, sporadic basis. Uh, not, you, you can't really, uh, you'll never know. It's, it's, they leave you wondering, hey, well, I see a whale shark this dot. But typically in the summer months, divers see them uh, at least once a month in the, in the area scuba divers dive off our Texas coast. And believe me, it is a sensation. Divers will, will go halfway around the world 
to see a, to swim with a whale shark, and we have them right off the Texas shoreline. Turtles, uh, lots and lots of marine turtles at the Flower Garden Banks. Um, this is a loggerhead turtle, of course. <clears throat> we also see hawksbill turtles, and on occasion, leatherback turtles. But this one here, very accommodating. This young boy at the East Flower Garden Banks uh, was on one of his very first open water dives in the ocean, and he got to swim with a loggerhead turtle. Now here I'm up uh, close, face to face, with a barracuda. And the interesting thing about this barracuda photo, I, I really like fish portraits. And I wanted to get a really nice portrait shot of a barracuda with those big teeth, big canine teeth. And yet, I didn't have to go down on the reef to get this photograph. I actually was able to take this photograph right under the dive boat. When the dive boats pull up to the Flower Garden Banks or any of the other Texas reefs, uh, the barracudas like to congregate in the shade underneath the boat. And so if you're an underwater photographer and you need a shot of a, a close-up shot like this of a barracuda, or you'd like to do this, uh, go out on a flower garden trip, but just go under the boat and you can get that shot. The blue angelfish, there's lots and lots of different angelfish at the flower gardens, very, very colorful. And this is one of my favorite fish portraits uh, of a blue angelfish. This is a red-banded parrotfish, and it's sleeping. Uh, people say, well, I didn't think fish can sleep, and meanwhile, its eyes open. Well, its eye can't close, and yes, it's resting. It's wedged. This was taken at night at the East Flower Gardens on a night dive, and uh, a lot of fish rest at night, and they just kind of lay and rest on a ledge or uh, get in an area where they can kind of wedge themselves and just lay down and not move and, and rest uh, through the night. And that's what this red-banded parrotfish is doing. There's about four different types of moray eels that you'll see out there. Uh, this, is, this is called a purple mouth moray eel. And this one here is a golden-tailed moray eel. The most common one is a spotted moray eel and I'll show you that later. Going back to the fish portraits, which I really have, have made a big effort in my portfolio of the Texas coral reefs is to do a lot of fish portraits. <clears throat> and of the uh, grouper sea bass family, there's about 16, 17, maybe 18 different species of grouper sea basses that you'll see out there. Um, this is a yellowfin grouper and uh, very accommodating for that photograph. Here's another night creature you will not see. This is a red clinging crab and uh, taken during a night dive at the West Flower Garden Bank. And um, you will not see this guy during the day. They're underneath in a hole underneath a ledge where you'd never be able to see them. They just like to come out at night and feed. And this is another night creature that you will not see during the day, a red night shrimp. And this guy is only about three inches long at that. And they have these very alien looking eyes that make for a great photographic subject, a very striking image. And this is a frog fish. And before I took this photograph, and actually I took this photograph 10 years ago, uh, before this photo was taken, the only frogfish I had ever seen in photograph were in Bonaire, and I had already been diving the flower gardens for 20 years, and I had never seen a frogfish. So you imagine my surprise 10 years ago when a diver from Austin came up on the dive boat and said, hey, I just saw a frogfish. And I, I couldn't believe him, but then he described to me where he saw it and gave me a really good directions on how to get there, and I went down. That's the frogfish that he saw, and I was able to capture it. I also photographed one at Stetson Bank later that same trip. And then years went by, and I didn't see any more frogfish. Now, I was just out there, as I already mentioned, last week, and I got great news that uh, up until about two weeks ago, there was 
a pair of orange, very bright orange frogfish at Stetson Bank near buoy number two. And now here's a really, really amazing, truly amazing phenomena that occurs every year in August at the East and West Flower Garden Banks. This is mass coral spawning. And seven to nine or 10 days after the August full moon, the coral reefs at the East and West Flower Garden Banks just erupt in a absolute, uh, it, it's like a snowstorm blizzard of reproduction. And some describe it as a upside down snowstorm. And here's a, a pretty good sized brain coral head just uh, uh, erupting in a, uh, in a reproduction display. And the thing that's, that's very, very uh, cool about this whole thing is it's completely predictable. Now this year was an, was an exceptional year, uh, or not a normal year from the standpoint that in August of this year, uh, there, there, uh, there's two full moons. There's a full moon, there was a full moon that's already taken place the first week in August, and then there's another full moon the last week in August. And so they, they call it a split spawning year. And there's already been one spawning trip. They saw coral spawning, and then the first week in September, there's an expectation for additional spawning at the flower garden banks. Other creatures get in the act during this mass coral spawning event, and these are two uh, ruby brittle stars. They got pretty excited by all the commotion, and uh, there's other, other uh, fish and animals and invertebrates that, uh, uh, that take part in this um, reproduction event that occurs every year. So now we're gonna move to Stetson Bank, which is the third reef of the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Stetson Bank is actually located uh, much closer in than the East and West Flower Gardens. It's only about 80 miles offshore in, uh, at a depth curve of about 180 feet. And uh, it became part of the National Marine Sanctuary uh, in 1996. So it's also a very protected area, uh, which is good. It's very small. It's not a true coral reef with a limestone base. Stetson Bank has a siltstone type base, but there are corals growing at Stetson Bank, and it's a very, very fishy place. Lots and lots of marine life, a very exciting place for fish watchers and underwater photographers. Along the northern part of Stetson Bank is a series of these big projections that come up off the reef. They call them the, the pinnacles. And this is what one of the pinnacles looks like, just completely filled with life, with sponges. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fire coral, which is this right here. And you have these big orange sponges here and tube sponges. Uh, this is a reef butterfly fish over here. And there's just a lot of life, a lot of action, a lot of activity going on at Stetson Bank. And at buoy number three, the first, uh, 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 now there's five buoys there. Buoy number three is a special buoy for me at Stetson Bank because very close to this mooring buoy is a coral formation that's shown in this photograph here, which is, uh, it's called Madrasis coral. And it's a 10 ray, a common name is a 10 ray coral. And this coral is one of the most beautiful reefs. It's a very small reef but it's my favorite reef in all of the flower gardens and really all of the Texas reefs that I've been to. This is my number one favorite and it happens to be on the front cover of my book, Texas Coral Reefs. But this is, this is called Madrasis Coral and uh, the, uh, the Creole fish that are hovering over it is very, you'll see that and you'll see the, the uh, uh, in the crooks and crannies, you'll, that spotted moray eel, the sergeant major. There's, you'll look in and see arrow crabs. You'll see just all sorts of life at this madrasis reef formation. Now here I'm backing up and giving you a better view. In this photograph, it looks like a pretty big reef, but in actuality, it's not. It's very, very small. It's only about, at the most, 20 feet across. 
but I used a very wide angle lens and it kind of accentuated the size. But it's a very small reef, but an extremely healthy reef and just full of coral. And so if you hear anybody say, oh, Stetson Bank doesn't have any coral, the answer is, well, it does have coral. And here's one of the finest displays of coral, uh, in my opinion, in the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Now here's a shot taken uh, last summer in 2011, and here's the uh, madrasis coral that I was just talking about. And the reason, what I'm really showing here, you can see the moray eel, the spotted moray eel, uh, and the angelfish there, the rock beauty. But look at this other peak and this diver over here. The visibility was so clear. This is 80 miles off the coast. And it was so clear that you could see from buoy number three all the way over to buoy number two, which is right over here. And that's a distance of 200 feet. It was an exceptional, remarkable visibility. And, it, and this is a, a photo that was an image from last week. Uh, and, but this is not the, the Madrasis coral formation I was just talking about, but this is Madrasis coral, obviously, and this is over at, at buoy number two at Stetson Bank. But what really struck me uh, when I took this photograph was just, again, all the life, the different, um, you know, the bluehead wrasse up there with, with all the chromis, just clouds and clouds of chromis. The beauty was just remarkable. And the colors, these sponges are just so bright. When you turn on your light or you, or you put on the flash, they, the colors just come right at you and it's just sensational to see the colors and the fish activity. Lots and lots of juvenile fish at Stetson Bank. One of the things that photographers do, and of course underwater photographers as well, is look for interesting patterns of nature. And this is a pattern shot that I got <clears throat> at Stetson Bank. And what this actually is, is the pectoral fin of a scorpion fish. The scorpion fish camouflage themselves in the reef. And you'll see in the next image exactly how they do this, but this is the, uh, obviously the head and the eye of a um, spotted scorpion fish. Very, very common at Stetson Bank. And there you can see a diver and this is on, on a ledge near buoy number one at Stetson Bank, and you can see the scorpion fish, and you can see how the colorations of this fish are so camouflaged with the reef itself, and they're able to actually do that and remain undetected by their predators. This is a smooth trunk fish, and Notice on this smooth trunk fish, I was trying, actually I was working with this trunk fish, again, going back to the fish portraitures, I was working with this trunk fish for quite a while to get this photograph because I was trying to get a head-on photo, see these big lips. You know, you look at these lips and you think, boy, that, he, they must be eating jellyfish or something, right? I mean, and, they're, uh, and these little teeth down here but these big, big lips, I wanted to really accentuate that in the photograph, and this is a smooth trunk fish. But guess what? At the Stetson Bank, our Stetson Bank, there's a, there's a morph, a colored morph, they call this the golden morph of the smooth trunk fish, that you will not see, if you go to Cozumel or Cayman or Florida, uh, you will not see a golden morph of a trunk fish. You'll see a white, a black and white trunk fish. So then it's like, well, what's going on? Why are we such a special place that we get to have this golden morph and other places don't? Well, I won't say that they're not anywhere else. As a matter of fact, I've, I know uh, from reports that there are, have had some spotted in other places in the Gulf of Mexico, in Veracruz, for example, and I also have heard reports down in Central America of the golden morph. But all the diving I've done in the Cayman Islands and Cozumel and other popular places, I have never, ever seen or photographed a golden morph. But I've got golden morph photos from the flower gardens. So for me, that is very special. This is a flame fish. Again, Stetson Bank. 
and you look at those eyes with those electric looking lines going across um, and you know that's a flame fish. A squirrel fish, very, very uh, pronounced dorsal fin with very striking yellow coloration uh, and a neon goby resting on the back of this squirrel fish. And so he was very accommodating and let me get, again, I wanted to get a fish portrait up close and that's what I got. Lots and lots of groupers. I mentioned before, uh, there's lots of species of grouper that you'll see at the flower garden banks. And this guy is called a Graysby and he's one of the most colorful, striking colorful grouper that you'll ever see. And another different approach for a, for a uh, portraiture, um, this is a rock beauty, which is a type of angel fish. And this guy just kept near my camera, I actually had a hard time moving it away from my camera to be able to get this photo. And this is called a, a, uh, a scrawled cowfish. And they have such interesting, fascinating patterns because I'm always interested in the striking patterns that, that the tropical fish have. And again, um, this guy's got some pretty funny lips and little teeth as well, but I worked with this fish for probably half the dive trying different types of uh, angles and um, experimenting with uh, different types of portraits. And so I got this one and I got that one right there that I really liked a lot. And uh, again, this gives you a, a very uh, good view of such a striking pattern of the scrawled cowfish. This is the other frogfish I'd mentioned before when I showed you the first one that there was a second one that I'd seen on the same trip at Stetson Bank. And this guy, uh, this is called a long lure, long lure frogfish. And here's the lure right here. And so they raise that lure and they dangle it and that's what they use to attract prey. They fish. And this little guy is called a sailfin blenny. And it was photographed at Stetson Bank near uh, mooring buoy number one. And they have, uh, they burrow in holes. They're very little. They're only a couple, two, three inches in length. And, but when they, they come out of their holes, they raise their dorsal fins and they, they dance and they put on a real show. And I've seen divers down just watching these, these fish almost their entire dive. And a red spotted hawkfish, another very colorful fish that you'll see at Stetson Bank and the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. <clears throat> this is a uh, golden tail moray eel. And if you've ever wondered what um, the throat looks like of a moray eel. Uh, you, have, you can wonder no more, okay? And again, the largest fish in the ocean, the whale shark. And this was 80 miles off our coast. And just a wonderful, wonderful gentle giant uh, cruising through the reef, eating plankton, and uh, making a, a, a real sensation for divers and snorkelers to see one of these animals. Another turtle, there's an, a number of resident turtles at Stetson Bank, as there are at the East and West Flower Gardens. This is another loggerhead turtle from, at Stetson Bank. And now here's one of my favorites, because this is, a, um, this is an image that really shows how a mother hermit crab is so protective of the little baby hermit crab. And um, it's uh, an unusual image to, to find. I've never seen a hermit crab uh, behave like that, but now you have. And again, the lobsters, the spiny lobsters that come out at night, this was not taken, that, that come out during the day, I should say. I mean, normally they come out at night, 
But this was a, during a day dive at Stetson Bank, and the lobsters just came out and started prancing around the Madrasis coral formation. And now this guy here looks a little weird with those, with those big alien looking eyes. Uh, it's a shrimp, and it's called a mantis shrimp. And it was, it's only about two inches long, and it was photographed at Stetson near buoy number one. But the thing about this guy is they've got razor sharp appendages right here, and you don't ever want to put your finger near one of these guys because their nickname is thumb splitters. And they will actually, in a split second, they'll just take a slice right through your finger. Okay, so now I want to go back and reorient. We've just taken a virtual dive through the east and west flower garden banks right here, and we've moved down to Stetson Bank. And again, this is the flower garden, currently the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, and it's all protected area around these reefs. Uh, currently, there's a plan that's in place to expand the sanctuary, and there's, there's about uh, nine new reefs that are being considered for this expansion. And we're going to take a quick look, of just a very quick look. I only have a few images to show you. But we're going to take a quick look at Saunier Bank right here, which is off of Louisiana. A real quick look at Bright Bank here, which is near the East Flower Garden Banks. And then Geyer Bank. We're going to finish up with the natural banks uh, at Geyer Bank. So Saunier Bank, what's this all about? This is... I, I consider Saunier Bank to be like the sister reef to Stetson Bank because it's about the same distance off of Louisiana that Stetson Bank is. It's not a true coral reef, uh, but it's got a lot of sponges. It's got a lot of, of, of uh, fire corals all over, algae, and it's a, a pretty thriving uh, reef. And of course, you've got all these angelfish swimming around and it's a very, very cool place to go, and I wish I was able to go there more than I have, believe me. But here's another shot showing the angelfish that just are all over this reef, and the huge sponges, and of course, the angelfish like to feed on the sponges. Now, here's an interesting guy. You look at it, and you'd think, well, that's a queen angelfish, and it may very well be a, a, a juvenile or younger queen angelfish, but more likely it's what's called a Townsend angelfish. And a Townsend angelfish is a, uh, a mix between, it's not a separate species, but it's a mix between, it's when a blue and a queen have been fooling around. And you get, this is what you get, a little bit of blue, a little bit of queen. And again, here's some more of uh, Sonia Bank, um, and the sponges, the fire corals. And here's a spotted moray eel, a little bit of a closer shot than before of the spotted moray eel swimming through Saunier Bank uh, through that crevice there. This ray here is called a rough tail net ray. It's one of the largest rays in the Gulf of Mexico. And yet it was just laying on the bottom and allowed me to swim right up to it and put my camera as close as you can uh, imagine to get this photograph right here, this close up of just part of his head and his eye. Now we're going to move over to Bright Bank. This is another bank. Uh, now, I, I should have explained that, that Sonia Bank is, is, a, is a pretty um, uh, somewhat easy recreational dive. It's difficult to get to because not too many boats go there, but the diving depths are 70, 80 feet. Bright Bank is a whole different story. Bright Bank, which is uh, about 15 miles or so east of these flower gardens, uh, the top of the shallowest portion of Bright Bank is 115 to 120 feet. So it's right at the edge of the maximum depth for recreational diving. And I was fortunate enough uh, to make a number of trips to Bright Bank. And, and what I saw, I saw some good things and I saw some very bad things, unfortunately. So the good things is this image right here, big mounds that were 
uh, covered with uh, uh, sponges and fire coral with a lot of tropical fish hovering over, um, a lot of uh, different types of wrasses and chromis, uh, and a lot of activity. And then the bad part was not too far away from where I took this picture right here at 120 feet, I saw this. And this is where uh, this bank is currently not protected. And what happened was some misguided treasure hunters came out here a number of years ago, and there were several expeditions thinking that they were going to find uh, Spanish galleon, gold, silver, or whatever. And they used explosives <coughs> and airlifts and basically um, destroyed a big portion of the reef at Bright Bank. And these are airlifts that were left behind. And there were a lot of other tools that were left behind. This is some of the structures that they were using to haul equipment around and haul buckets of uh, material and maybe uh, uh, different types of tools around. And they just abandoned all this. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure exactly why, but they felt they had to get out of Dodge and they left. Uh, the, ex the, the project probably uh, uh, ran out of money. But uh, it's very disturbing to see what can happen when an area off our Texas coast is not properly protected. So now we're going to move to Geyer Bank. Geyer Bank, outside of the East and West Flower Gardens in Stetson Bank, my favorite reef to dive on, hands down, is Geyer Bank. And I was lucky enough back in the early 2000s to go out there and make several trips out there. I haven't been there recently because uh, it, this, like Bright Bank, is a deep dive. It's 120 feet to the shallowest portion of Bright Bank. And so it uh, requires a different level of training to get there. And the current dive boat doesn't go out there. But so what's so great about, about Geyer Bank? Why do I like it so much? And, you know, the bottom is, 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 uh, has a lot of similarities to some of the other banks outside of the Flower Garden banks. It's not a true coral reef. Uh, there's lots of sponges, lots of algae, but it's the fish. And here you see uh, uh, quite a few reef butterfly fish, and you see the rock beauties, but it gets better. Now, look at all those reef butterfly fish. Well, that's a lot of reef butterfly fish. Well, I'll tell you, there were hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds. Now here, you see a nice variety of fish, you know, just a few reef butterfly fish, a lot of wrasses, some chromis. But now, here's what I'm talking about. <laughs> just literally hundreds, for as far as the eye can see, of reef butterfly fish. And I'll tell you that with all of the diving that I've done around the world, including the Pacific Ocean, I had never been on a reef with so many reef butterfly fish until I went to Geyer Bank. And it's just a completely amazing little reef. And it's a tiny little reef off our coast. So now, that, those are the natural reefs we have off of the coast of Texas, the Flower Garden Banks and the other reefs. And you may wonder, well, what, what about all those other reefs that you showed on that map? And those other reefs, and there's about 30 of them, are too deep for recreational diving. But there's a lot of natural banks out there, uh, a lot of reefs off our coast, and most of them are just too deep to go down and do underwater photography. But now I'm going to talk uh, briefly about artificial reefs, and that'll wind this down. Uh, this is a uh, as, as I'm sure everybody knows, with the oil and gas industry that we have off our shoreline, the unintended bonus of putting all of these platforms and structures out there is they created just a huge number of ecosystems, and they're full of life. And above water, you look, it's a very industrial look. You know, you've got an oil or gas platform sticking out of the water, and there's work going on. And like this one here, this is off of Port O'Connor, uh, very well-maintained, painted. Guys are up there working. 
They're very friendly to fishermen and divers. They let people pull up on their boats and scuba dive even while they're operating, which is very good. You know, we have in the Gulf of Mexico a pretty good relationship between industry and uh, the recreational groups, fishermen and divers. But now let's go below and see what we got below. Below is a virtual reef of tropical fish, but the reef is not limestone based, uh, it's steel based. And there's just loads upon loads of fish. And here you see this pretty dramatic school of Atlantic spade fish just cruising through an artificial reef off our coast. And this is called a look down, again, one of my portrait efforts, but this was at an artificial reef. And this is at a, a structure that actually happens to be located within the East Flower Gardens um, boundary of the East Flower Gardens sanctuary. It's called High Island 389. And um, this was taken just uh, a few years ago of a loggerhead turtle. You see the diver in the background. And there's at least two, possibly more, loggerhead turtles that live at this platform structure that's about a mile and a half from the reef cap, the natural reef cap at the East Flower, at the East Flower Garden Bank. Tube sponges, just loaded with tropical fish. And this guy is called a tessellated blenny. He's only about a couple inches long, and they hide out, these blennies hide out in vacant barnacle shells. That's where they live. And you can get up close with it. You need a macro type lens on your underwater camera to get a shot like this. And this, uh, this is called a Goliath grouper, the biggest of the groupers. And they live, they like to hang around. I was uh, recently on a trip to Florida, and I was on a platform <clears throat> off of Fort Myers where we saw uh, over a dozen Goliath grouper. And here we go back to the sharks. See, sharks are afraid of me. See how they're swimming away? Huh? <laughs> Do I, I mean, do I scare you? <laughs> uh, these are called silky sharks. And the silky sharks uh, like to hover around the platform at Highland 380, 389 platform near the East Flower Garden Banks. And it's, it, they're, it's pretty dramatic to see so many of them. But as I swim away, they're, they're really like, a lot of sharks are like cats. And, you know, when you confront a cat, they usually, it usually startles them and they, they back away, but then when you turn around and start walking away, they follow you and they're curious and they want to see what you're doing. Sharks are in a way like that as well. Uh, not all sharks, but a lot of sharks. And to get a close up photo of a lot of different types of sharks, you have to pretend you're not paying attention to them. Don't look them in the eye and act like you're swimming away and then they'll approach you, then you turn around and get your shot. Then, then startle them. So these are silky sharks. And this is a sea anemone that was photographed on an artificial reef. And it, again, is a nature's uh, art. And the colors and the shapes and the forms are what make me go back again and again and again. And I hope that the images um, and that I've shown you tonight and sharing my passion that I have with the flower gardens, the flower garden banks and Texas coral reefs uh, will inspire you to, uh, uh, to, to look at these reefs as, as areas that we need to uh, protect, uh, respect, and, and keep loving. Thank you very much. And thank you. Um, do we have we have time for some for some? Okay, sure. Do we have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Hmm? What what dive boat do you normally take out there? Right now, there's really only one dive boat going out there. It's called the MV Fling, Hello. and they operate out of Freeport. It's a hundred foot long converted crew boat. At one time, early in the 2000s, there were three boats going out there three big converted crew boats. Now, there's only one, the, the, uh, 
The Fling is a, is a good boat. It's uh, 100 feet long. It takes up to 30 divers. It's an overnight trip. You run out. It takes a good seven hours to get out there. And so you go out. If you're going on a weekend trip, you run out on Friday night while you're sleeping. You wake up Saturday morning. You're there. And believe me, when you arrive at the Flower Garden Banks, uh, you feel like you're in the middle of the, of the Caribbean. It's the water is that clear and blue and refreshing. And it's just absolutely beautiful out there. It's, it's, uh, and so you'll stay out there Saturday and make uh, four or five dives, Sunday make a couple of dives and then come in Sunday night. And the beauty of being a diver living in the Houston area or not too far away from Freeport, Texas, is you can go out and get in a lot of dives over the weekend and you know go to work Monday morning if you need to. Don't even have to get on a plane or take a or bring your passport. You know, you don't have to go through T TSA and you can see a whale shark. Huh? <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, what are the geologic reasons for these uh, banks to be out there? Oh, wait, I got a technical question here. <laughs> I'm glad I got some technical support down here. Well, what, what is out there are salt domes, and they're really on top of salt domes. And, and that's, you know, there's all sorts of oil and gas out there. I mean, there's, I mean, that whole area is filled with oil and gas, but there's salt domes, and these coral, these coral reefs actually grew on the top of these bulges that came up from the bottom. Because at the east and west flower garden banks, the surrounding uh, ocean there, the in, at Gulf of Mexico is about 400 feet deep. And yet it pushed up to a depth of within 60 feet of the surface. And that's the right depth for the coral cap to form. You need clear water, you need nutrients, and you need sunlight. Those are the three basic elements. And you can have a coral reef. I must. Okay. So, oh, yes. Jesse, you only had one photograph of any man-made damage out there, uh, but I'm sure you've taken a lot more. And uh, do you see a lot of uh, things like uh, anchor drag damage to, to the reefs, or are you concerned about some of the other areas outside of the flower gardens that might still be used as anchorages? Or oh, absolutely. Yeah, so let me answer it this way. Inside the flower garden sanctuary, anchor damage, cables being dragged, long lines, this kind of stuff. No, I, I can't say I have seen uh, uh, in recent years. Now, back in the late 1980s and early 1900s, right when the, uh, the, when the flower gardens became protected, yes, there was a lot of that. There, was, uh, there were people dragging anchors, and there were cables, and there was all sorts of stuff going on. Now that it's been a sanctuary for as long as it has been, uh, and, and, and it's really been respected, mostly. You know, there are a few exceptions, maybe. But I think that most people really respect uh, the Flower Garden Banks uh, as a sanctuary. Very, I can't even think of some type of uh, physical damage done that I've seen recently. The one thing I did see that was a little bit that more than a little bit, it was very disconcerting, was uh, at Stetson Bank, I have an image where people had killed, caught and killed sharks and cut the fins, cut the fins off the sharks, gutted them, filleted them, and then just threw the sharks on top of Stetson Bank. This was about five years ago. And I swam by and I saw these, these sharks that were just gutted and the fins cut off. That was, but th that wasn't the reef itself. That was marine life. Uh, but people shouldn't be doing things like that. Now, when you go <coughs> outside of the sanctuary to places like Geyer Bank and Bright Bank, you will see uh, damage from anchoring and, um, and other stuff that's going on. Obviously, the, the, the treasure hunting it was, it was a terrible destruction of the reef. But uh, outside of the protected areas, uh, they're still very, very vulnerable to uh, anchor damage and other types of damage. Yeah. Yes. 
for the natural reefs uh, that you were talking about, what are the um, approximate dimensions? Of the natural reefs. Uh, of the, nat uh, the natural reefs? Yeah. Well, in terms of acres, uh, there's about two. Let me see if I'm re remembering this right. I think the, f the East Flower Garden Banks is about 500 acres, and the West about 250. Is that right, Steve? Mm -hmm. Roughly? About half that, I think, on each one of those. Mm -hmm. Okay, 250 and 125? I remember right. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so roughly in terms of acres, you know, the East is maybe 300 acres, and uh, I think I got it right in my book, okay? You need to buy a copy of my book. And well, there's GP. Tell me, what, is it 250 and 125? I think that's right. I'm okay, okay. Uh, so I do know this, that the east is about double the coral cap of the west. And the east, even though I've said that the east and west are very similar, and they are, uh, me personally, I've noticed that the east has, um, seems to be, a little more robust in, in life and, and color than the West, but the West is good. Uh, one fact um, that I'll mention that is a very, very cool fact for us who are Texans and want to take credit and pride in the natural beauty that we have off our coast is this. The coral reefs that we have, they may be tiny, they, and compared to other, you know, the Florida Keys or Hawaii or other places, they're very small, very tiny, but the health of the reefs and the amount of coral cover on these reefs is off the charts. There's, um, there's a, over 50% coral cover on these reefs, which is way, way up there. And, uh, and the reefs, I can tell you from last week at the East Flower Gardens, I was just really, really happy with what I saw in terms of the health of that, those reefs. And from back in the 1970s, my first trip out there, I'd say they're just as colorful and as healthy now as they were then. And one of the advantages we have that other, that say Florida certainly doesn't have the advantage that these reefs have because they're, uh, so they're, they're not easy to get to. They're 100 miles off the coastline and you can't get in your center console with a single 90 horsepower and go out there and dive on the reef. It won't work. You need a big, big machine to get out there. So the fact that they're, um, uh, one of the recent descriptions that I saw of our flower garden banks was uh, their magic in the middle of nowhere. And they really are. But anyway, I, I, I gave you a long answer. Was there more to your question, or was that it? I got it? Okay, good. Yes. Are there any active oil and gas vents in the vicinity of the flower garden? Oil and gas? Vents. Where there's just, you're talking about a natural vent? A natural vent. Oh, there, yeah, there's natural vents all over the place. Yeah. So they, okay. But is that, I mean, all over the Gulf of Mexico, I mean, you can look at the amount of of seepage that's coming out around, you know, all throughout the Gulf of Mexico, all that information's available, and it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, sure, but is it, uh, I don't, I'd have to ask the sanctuary manager if there's any concerns about any of that. I haven't heard that there is. Is there any concerns about uh, natural seepage or venting in the vicinity of the flower garden uh, banks? No, no, we, uh, we actually see um, uh, active methane seeps uh, quite often, up, even up on the reef top. Um, we have never seen a, um, a, you know, an oil seep in the, in the immediate vicinity of the flower garden banks. Uh, that would probably more, be more of a concern, but we see you know, bubbling methane quite often, and that's, that's not a concern really to, um, to the environment, okay. uh, as far as I know. Okay. All right. Thanks, GP. Yes. Uh, many of the reefs around the world seem to already be suffering from uh, warmer waters and acidification. What's the prognosis for these? Are, is there a certain timeline that we need to be concerned about? Well, let me start the answer and then I'm going to defer to our sanctuary manager on this. But uh, there has been, I can tell you that there has been a coral bleaching events at the flower gardens and there has been recoveries. There's been uh, algae covering and, and recovery. But uh, as far as a prognosis, how would you answer that, GP, as far as uh, is there any, do you, do you, I mean, any different than any of the other 
reefs in the world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, again, it's, it is a concern uh, at worldwide, really, because uh, the the, uh, the rise in sea in seawater temperatures uh, around coral reefs uh, has caused bleaching and mortality um, in many places throughout the Caribbean, throughout the world. Uh, again, the Flower Run Banks does benefit from being deeper than most uh, coral reefs. So, um, you know, the the shallower you are, the more uh, variation you'll have in temperature, the more you'll feel that um, uh, warm water uh, changes. So we are somewhat buffered from that. But you know, the long-term prognosis is if things go like they have been uh, in recent um, in, in recent years, and, and and the temperature keeps rising, and the seawater temperature keeps rising then there will be a problem even at the depths of the flower grain banks. Good. Okay. Yes. Oh, you're first. Well, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ambassador. Uh, you, made, you referred to the good relationship that you divers have between these platform operators photographing and diving around the artificial base. I was just curious if you had ever been permitted to photograph immediately after the implosion of one of those artificial reefs, the aftermath, and what that was like. Of the, when, when they've removed it, decommissioned it? Yes. Uh, I never have. I have, and I have never attempted to. Uh, I've never even witnessed a decommissioning activity. Um, so, but if, uh, but really your question is, if you asked, hey, can I, would they let you? Uh, I don't know. I, I really can't answer that. I have never seen one either to be honest with you I've never seen one I mean I know that if you when you do remove a structure out there and there's life the 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 best way to do it is to mechanically cut if you have to remove the, the structure and the worst thing you can do is use explosives and I mean that should be pretty obvious as to why uh, but uh, no I haven't seen that and this this whole artificial reef has is, is, uh, become uh, uh, really highlighted now. Uh, there's uh, and, and somewhat of a controversial subject area uh, because so many of them are uh, expected to be removed in the next uh, next few years. Yes. Yes, I can, I can point you towards the publication we have on our website of Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Go to BOEM.gov and we actually funded a study through National Marine Fisheries to look specifically at the impact on fisheries attracted or living on platforms due to explosive removal. And there's actually images of the actual explosions going on. Oh, okay. It's very interesting. Okay, okay. And, then, and there's evaluations of all the mortalities. The fish that stay there obviously are not going to do very well. <laughs> but they've done the assessment of what that means uh, in the big picture, and, and it's okay. relatively small. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate that. Okay, anybody else? Because we have a, some more, we're going to have a video and one more. Do the hurricanes uh, do a lot of damage to these reefs they out can. there? They can. Na yeah, na and nature can damage the coral reef. There's no doubt about it. Even though it's so deep. Even though they're so deep, yes. During height. Uh, and, and GP, wasn't the wave action uh, something like over 40 feet during height? And there were some. Well, the, the weather buoy actually gave out um, during during Ike, but it was it recorded uh, officially up to 28 feet um, waves, and, and it, that was before the 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 eye actually hit. So it's it was estimated that it got that high. Yeah. Yes. And there were uh, there were coral heads that were toppled. Yes, there were. Because of ice. A lot of sediment moving around. A lot of a lot of impact. And then there was sand and sediment that smothered. Uh, covered and caused problems on areas of coral. Corals the size of Volkswagens when moving. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Just uh, three quick things. Uh, thank you, Jesse, for this. Uh, the Jesse's books uh, out front on the side over here. Uh, provided by Texas A&M University Press. And when we initially put out the information about this, we thought we were gonna be selling them ourselves and we said cash only. But we're fortunate that a uh, Texas A&M Press sales representative came. And if you had your credit cards, he said he would take those. And they're only $10, great Christmas gifts. You're gonna stack up on them. <laughs> Secondly, uh, to take advantage of all these uh, 
illustrious scientists and experts that are here for your reception. Uh, I'd like for the experts that will be speaking tomorrow to stand up so that uh, you can see those if you'd like to speak with them during our reception so you can see them. Uh, John Anderson over here from Rice, a geologist. Uh, Harriet Nash from Texas a and Corpus Christi. Uh, here in the front, Greg Bowen, you just heard him uh, speak earlier, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management from Washington, D.C. G.P. Schmall is the uh, head of the National Marine Sanctuary for the Flower Garden. Bill Frank, used to be from NOAA. Uh, he'll be telling some neat stories about the branching corals that just appeared uh, tomorrow. Uh, Quint Moore, back in the back, representing industry for us. And Rich McLaughlin over here in Policy and Law from the Hart Institute at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Andre Roxler here from Rice, one of the few that studied the banks in South Texas. So see who these people are and do them. I'd like 200 people to stand up. Uh, Steve, stand up. And Billy, stand up. Uh, Steve Giddings uh, helped get the National Marine Flower, Flower Bank National Marine Sanctuary established, and now he's a lead scientist with NOAA uh, in Washington, D.C. Billy is from Corpus Christi, uh, a longtime good friend. He's in charge of all the National Marine Sanctuaries in the South Atlantic, the Caribbean, and the Gulf of Mexico. So he knows a lot, and he's really a cool guy. So <laughs> Thirdly, uh, we have a surprise for you. Uh, Sylvia Earle was supposed to be here, and so we started to advertise it. We thought, well, we better wait until we're sure. And sure enough, she, she's in the Cook Islands now, and she was going to leave and come back early to be here with us, and I asked her to stay longer. And so she's over there saving the oceans, as she does. Most of you, I think, know who she is, a world-famous oceanographer. Her favorite title, and she's got many, is uh, the uh, Explorer in Residence at the National Geographic. She just kind of quivers when she says that. <laughs> so fun. But she's also the chair of our advisory board for the Harvard Research Institute. So we're closely affiliated with her. Her favorite part of the ocean is the Gulf of Mexico. That's why she wanted to be here. She couldn't be here, but she made a video for us, just a little three or three and a half minute video on the flower gardens two weeks ago when we had our annual dive trip from the Heart Institute. She went along and spent several days, almost a week, out there with them diving. And so she made a little clip that she wanted us to show you to welcome you to this. So we're going to show you that little clip now. Maybe just one word. Oh. Sylvia will be coming, you know, sometimes in early spring here at the Baker Institute. So we will, you know, give you, you know, the information when we know the date. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh -huh. So I think uh, our electronics guy is going to make this happen. More magic. On behalf of the Baker Institute and the Heart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies, I want to welcome you to this conference on Texas coral reefs. I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an ocean explorer, explorer in residence at the National Geographic, and I've been associated with the Heart Research Institute since, since it was founded in 2000. This celebration, this conference, is an occasion to really dive into what is now known, the past, the present, and maybe to anticipate the future of the coral reefs that are here in Texas here in the Gulf of Mexico, where I'm standing at the moment. I wish I could be with you, but I certainly am there in spirit to celebrate this occasion where scientists, policymakers, artists, those associated with industry, people who care about the Texas coral reefs, about the future of the blue Texas, that area beyond the shore out into the Gulf, this is the time, the first time, that we really understand how important the Gulf of Mexico is and the coral reefs that lie within that system, that how important they really are. When I was a kid, I knew about the Gulf of Mexico and knew about coral reefs down in the Florida Keys and even some that were near where I lived along the Florida West Coast. But coral reefs in Texas? Who knew? It was not until the mid-1960s that I heard about the flower garden banks. And it was later that I understood that, you know, there are coral reefs all along the Texas coast and continuing on down 
to Mexico. I mean, the corals don't stop just because there's a border, nor all the creatures that are associated with these reefs. Now we know what we couldn't know 50 years ago. If we wait another 50 years to take actions now to protect these undersea treasures, we're going to lose options that are now available to us. Now we know that humans have the power to influence not just coral reefs, not just the ocean, but the nature of nature. And that now is the moment in history when really for the first time we have information and this conference really begins to connect the dots about what we know, what we need to know in order to make smart decisions about the future. The coral reefs, of course, but they're s symbols really of the greater issues that are being addressed as the underlying theme of this conference. So I wish I were there with you. I wish you were here with me in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> Mainly, I really hope that this conference will result in a step forward, a giant step forward, in terms of understanding the Gulf and taking action to ensure that the future is going to be at least as good as what we have today. And with knowing and the caring that comes with knowing, there's a good chance that our legacy will be, and your legacy will be, that the Texas coral reefs of today will be better tomorrow. Okay, uh, with that, I think the reception is ready. Please uh, come and enjoy. Thank you for coming. I hope you come back tomorrow, those of you who can. Thank you.